finally, finally, I can see a tribe of Kiwis, finally. Kia ora, Kiwis. It's time to wake up. On 3rd of February 2021, MedSafe, under Section 23 of the Medicines Act 1981, gave provisional approval for the use of the pfizer Comirnaty vaccine within NZ, subject to a long list of conditions. The list of conditions was published in the Gazette Notice of the same day. Our episode 5 discussed key elements of that provisional approval, in case you missed the details. Since then, the judge in the High Court case of KTI versus the Minister of Health, et al., found that there was significant reason to accept that the government's more or less no-holds-barred rollout plan did not meet the terms of any approval that could be given under the Medicines Act. The judge suggested that the government should rethink their plan carefully. Instead, the government rethought the law. And the very next day, with the help of the opposition parties, changed the legal basis for the provisional consent which underlies NZ's vaccine rollout. I'll come back to that later. On 3rd of June 2021, MedSafe put out an update related to the provisional consent to use the Pfizer vaccine. It addressed a number of issues including information that had been missing at the time of the provisional consent and which had been the subject of some of the conditions imposed. This update contains a number of links, including one to the Pfizer data sheet for NZ, which, although undated, appears to have been unchanged for some months. It also refers to an undated risk management plan, RMP, which has no version number, so is presumably unchanged since the provisional approval was given. The risk management plan notes that the Comirnaty data sheet, consumer medicine information and the package leaflet give essential information for healthcare professionals and patients on how to use the vaccine. Package leaflets put the important data into the hands of the doctor or other vaccinator at the time of the injection. I haven't seen a, an NZ package leaflet, but this is what they look like in other countries. Moderna, Pfizer, and Janssen. Let's start with when doctors do inform consent, They have to know what the risks and benefits are. To do that, we have package inserts. We also have a big book called the Physician Desk Reference, which is nothing more than a reprint of all these package inserts. This is what they get at the pharmacies. This is what they get to see and read, and what we get to see and read in the Physician Desk Reference. Ladies, this one is which one? Potentially. <laughs> so, um, this one is, this one is, that's Janssen Moderna. This is Pfizer, right? This is Pfizer? Pfizer. Okay. Is that open? No, take that. Take, okay. You have that? Okay. Stand this direction. I want you to look at the camera. I want you to open up both of those package inserts and see what information we have as physicians to tell us what the benefits and the risks of these vaccines are. (laughs) Open them all the way up. So, the benefits and the risks that we're supposed to draw conclusions from to provide you informed consent are that. (laughs) 
obviously there's a lot of talk about the safety and efficacy of the Comirnaty or Pfizer vaccine here in New Zealand. There is on the MedSafe website, uh, see the link below, a summary of the risk management plan for Comirnaty COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Now looking through this article doesn't take long uh, if we scroll down to table one which has a list of important risks and missing information. Now important identified risks anaphylaxis. Okay that's good. Have they been telling the public about this? Important potential risks. Okay vaccine associated enhanced disease or VAED including vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease. Now also other missing information, use in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. Uh, an update on our advice around vaccination with the uh, Pfizer vaccine in pregnancy. Today we are publishing updated advice based on um, a request we made to our technical advisory group and that recommends that pregnant people are now routinely offered COVID-19 vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine at any stage of pregnancy. This is because uh, uh, the technical advisors have uh, agreed that the risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19 infection are significantly higher for pregnant people than they are for the general population. Remember in pregnant women, the only thing we allow is the inactivated flu shot and the tetanus, uh, diphtheria, and pertussis, which is inactive. We never let anything pathogenic into a woman's body who's pregnant, never. When we give the vaccine, all the forms of the vaccine produce the viral spike protein. They, they it produce one type, by the way, the Wuhan original type, which, by the way, is long gone in the United States. We got 14 strains right now. Wuhan original is not one of them. But you produce that in a high quantity in the body, that is directly pathogenic. It causes blood clotting. It damages the blood vessels, causes fever. So we are actually having women's bodies produce a pathogenic protein for a few days. And we don't do that with any other vaccine? Never. I'm trying not to use the F word on TV now, but I'm getting upset hearing this. Why, <laughs> why would we do that? I'm not a public health official. I'm a doctor. I don't think like public health officials. It appears to be out of an air of, of we've had a year of, of this difficult time in America of trying to make a new product through American innovation available to everybody. And there was an idea of we'll make it available and then try to weigh benefit and risk later on under the investigational uh, uh, use uh, EUA period. As a doctor, I can tell you, I am not recommending pregnant women get the vaccine. I'm not recommending actually any of the excluded groups from the trials get the vaccine. We have no information on safety and we have no information on efficacy. It violates a simple medical practice principle. We don't use things where we don't have a signal of benefit or acceptable safety. Missing information also on the use in immunocompromised patients. Uh, also missing information for the use in frail patients with comorbidities, e.g. chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, chronic neurological disease, cardiovascular disorders. Now this is probably our biggest risk group and they haven't been tested on it would appear. Missing information. Now also regarding the missing information, these groups on which there is no data are precisely the target groups that are being used as selling points for the vaccination. Uh, missing information also in use in patients with autoimmune or inflammatory disorders. Missing information on interaction with other vaccines. And the big one at the end, folks, missing information, long-term safety data. Well, there is none, of course, so we are flying blind. Right, let's have a closer look at Table 3, which uh, headlines Important Potential Risk, Vaccine-Associated Enhanced Disease, Evidence for linking the risk to the medicine. VAED is considered a potential risk because it has not been seen in human studies with this or other COVID-19 vaccines being studied. It has not been seen in vaccine studies in animal models of the SARS-CoV-2 virus either. However, 
in selected vaccine studies in animal models as well as in some laboratory studies in animal cells infected with two other related coronaviruses SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV abnormalities in immune responses or cellular responses indicative of VAED were observed. Because of this, VAED is considered a potential risk. In the past, there have been other examples of particularly respiratory viruses where VAED has been observed. For example, some children who received an inactivated respiratory syncytical virus vaccine, a different type of virus, had worse signs of disease when they were subsequently infected with respiratory syncytical virus. VAED is thought to occur by several mechanisms where the immune response is not fully protective and actually either causes the body to have an inflammatory reaction due to the type of immune response with specific types of T-cells or the body does not produce enough strong antibodies to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection of cells or produces weak antibodies that actually bind to the virus and help it to enter cells more easily leading to worse signs of disease. Last year the Osaka Japanese group published a paper that's on this website talking about antibody dependent enhancement. Now in the past what that's meant is you make antibodies to something and it increases the blood clotting. This is brand new. This antibody dependent enhancement attaches to part of that spike protein called the N-terminal. And when it does it, it opens up the spike protein to make it more infective. And they discovered that part of the reasons why people in hospitals were not doing better even when they made antibodies is because the antibodies they made might have too much antibody to the N-terminal domain. So just because you can make an antibody doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, which raises questions about vaccinations for the number of people to get them to make antibodies. The goal shouldn't be so much to try to prime you for when you get infected, but to treat you when you get infected and to treat the inflammatory response if you get COVID-19. Not sure about you, but that last comment seemed to point to a lot of unknowns. And for me, that is a red flag. Surely we should be using the precautionary principle in that case. Let's have a quick look at Table 10, uh, some of the studies they are looking to follow. Purpose of the study. The objective of the study is to evaluate the safety, tolerability, immunogenicity and efficacy of COVID-19 mRNA vaccine an unfavorable imbalance between the vaccine and control groups in the frequency of COVID-19, in particular for severe COVID-19, may suggest the occurrence of vaccine-associated enhanced disease. Surveillance is planned for two years following dose two. So, as I said, folks, we're in the dark here. We need to make informed decisions. We need our family members, our friends to read these sort of facts freely available on the MedSafe website, but not parroted by the media, unfortunately. Now, regarding efficacy, of course, the 95% efficacy rate spouted by the government uh, for how good this uh, Pfizer vaccine is, is only relative. It is not absolute efficacy. Absolute efficacy is tiny. You know, what they did during the studies is, uh, you know, there's two messenger RNA uh, gene therapy treatments, uh, you know, quote unquote vaccines uh, that they have replied in Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, and they said the safety, I mean, the efficacy for reducing symptoms was 95 and 94 percent. And then uh, AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson said theirs were like 67 percent. And what they're dealing with then is what we call relative risk. So you know, if I say to you, I bought two lottery tickets and you bought one, well, I'm twice as likely to get the lottery as you are, but neither one of us is very likely to get the lottery. There's a lot of terms used about the efficacy of vaccines and you should know three terms. The relative risk reduction. This is what you've heard so much about, the 95%, the 94%, the 65%. 
This is how many people got diagnosed with COVID in the vaccinated group versus the people who got diagnosed with COVID in the non-vaccinated group. There's a more important term for you to understand, and that's absolute risk reduction, which is a comparison of those groups that says, what's the real difference between those groups? And we're gonna look at those numbers as well. And then there's the number needed to vaccinate, which is how many people would you have to vaccinate to try to reduce one person from being diagnosed with COVID? These are what you hear about. So what does vaccine efficacy mean? It really means, when they're saying this number, that they're looking at the number of people who got vaccinated and then were diagnosed with COVID. This is one example from Pfizer, compared to the people who did not get vaccinated who got diagnosed with COVID. And when you do the math, it gives you 0.05. One minus that number tells you vaccine efficacy. You multiply it by 100, it gets you percent. So how did they decide who made the diagnosis of COVID? Well, you had to have two things. You had to have a positive PCR test and you had to have a set of symptoms. Now, Pfizer's group is that group. The symptoms that are there are the same symptoms you would get with any infection. Viral, bacterial, fungal, tuberculosis, and in some cases, cancer. It's not very discriminating. Moderna, same problem, same issue. Again, I know they're small. You can download them, read through them. They're what you will normally have for symptoms. Aches and pains, muscle discomfort, diarrhea, cough, runny nose, that type of thing. Your body's letting you know something's wrong. And Janssen, this is Johnson Johnson. The company that makes it is Janssen. That's why I refer to it. This is a Belgium company, which by the way, Belgium pulled this from the market. So you got those two things, you get a diagnosis of COVID. So let's look at the actual emergency use authorization documents. And if we look at Pfizer's to begin with, and we, do what they just asked us to do for vaccine efficacy, you'll find in the confirmed cases that eight people who got vaccinated were diagnosed with COVID, okay? In the non-vaccinated group, 162 got diagnosed with COVID and you do the math and it comes up with a 95% efficacy. But you're not asking how often you're gonna get COVID. Your question is, will it prevent me from getting diagnosed with COVID? Will it prevent me from dying from COVID? So let's look at the data, their data, not mine. <clears throat> if we ask for confirmed COVID cases, you'll see that in the vaccinated group for Pfizer, there were 17,411 people. There you go. Eight people were diagnosed with COVID, which leaves you with 17,403. It gives you a value. Non-vaccinated, there were 17,511. 162 were diagnosed with COVID, which leaves you with 17,349 who did not develop COVID. Those are the numbers. If you're a scientist like me, you don't just look at those numbers, you statistically analyze them to ask a question, is there any real difference between those two groups? And it turns out that when you do that, there's not. It's not statistically different. But looking at that more important number, what was the absolute risk reduction? Well, remember this, 0 0.93, minus the difference in those vaccinated gives you an actual absolute risk reduction of 0.88%. If you ask if it cut down on the risk of death, well, here's the data. Page 41, Pfizer had two deaths, no vaccine group had four. And what does this say? There is no statistically significant difference in the numbers of deaths and they represent what is seen in the general population. So Pfizer, no statistical difference whether you get vaccinated or not and no change in deaths.
Now, MedSafe approved the VAX for provisional use within the limitations of the Medicines Act. Now that the Act has been changed to widen applicability, shouldn't MedSafe be asked to reconsider whether their approval still applies? Righty-ho Kiwis, if you like this, press the like button, share around to your friends and also the links are in the video header. Oh, the gold It's what we're told Just make money Then roll Now the game is up I see through it all The banks rob us blind then let us fall Finally, finally I can see a tribe of Kiwis Finally Get off your knees Live the last days on your feet Finally I can see it, how it is, the sleight of hand, finally, yeah, we can see it, yeah, if we open our eyes, the shady plan, finally, get off your knees and live the last days on your feet, see the truth and live those last days. Dead free